Hello again. This is Math 1120 coming to you from the College of DuPage. The title of this lecture is Sound, Hearing, and Intensity. And as always, please be an attentive learner as you watch this video. Sound and Hearing. Sound can travel in gases such as air, liquids such as water, and solid materials. The simplest sound waves are sine waves, which have definite frequency, amplitude, and wavelength. The human ear is sensitive to waves in the frequency range from about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. But we also use the term sound for similar waves with frequencies above, called ultrasonic, and below, called infrasonic, the range of human hearing. Sound waves may also be described in terms of variations of pressure at various points. We've talked a bit about this. In sine sound waves in air, the pressure fluctuates above and below the atmospheric pressure, P of A, with a sine variation having the same frequency as the motion of the air particles. The maximum variation in pressure above and below the atmospheric pressure is called the pressure amplitude, denoted by Pmax. Microphones and similar devices usually sense pressure variations, not displacements. Measurements of sound waves show that in the loudest sounds the human ear can tolerate without pain, the maximum pressure variations are in the order of Pmax is equal to 30 pascals above and below atmospheric pressure. P sub A. Nominally 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals at sea level. If the frequency is 1000 hertz, the corresponding amplitude maximum displacement is about 0.012 millimeters. This is a very small displacement and this makes the human ear remarkably sensitive. Thus, the displacement amplitude of even the loudest sounds is extremely small. The maximum pressure variation in the faintest audible sound of frequency 1000 hertz is only about 3 times 10 to the minus 5 pascals. The corresponding displacement is about 10 to the minus 11 meters. For comparison, the wavelength of yellow light is 6 times 10 to the minus 7 uh, meters, and the diameter of the molecule is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. The ear is an amazing piece of work. It is an extremely sensitive organ. The structure of the human ear. When a sound wave enters the auditory canal, it causes the eardrum to vibrate. The vibration is transmitted to three small bones called the incus, malus and the stapes. This motion is in turn transmitted to a fluid field cochlea of the inner ear. The motion of the cochlea fluid is that imparted to the specialized ear hair cells shown here and the resulting nerve impulses are transmitted to the brain. An amazing thing. Sound intensity. Like all other waves, sound waves transfer energy from one region to another. We define the intensity of a wave, denoted by I, as the average rate at which energy is transported by the wave per unit area across a surface perpendicular to the direction of propagation. That is, the intensity I is the average power per unit area. The intensity of the faintest sound wave that can be heard by a human with normal hearing is about 10 to the minus 12, and this will come in power, watts, per square meter, or 10 to the minus 16 watts per square centimeter. The average total power, energy per unit time, carried across the surface by a sound wave equals the product of the intensity, power per unit area at the surface, and the surface area, assuming that the intensity over the surface area is uniform. 
the average total sound power emitted by a person speaking in an ordinary conversational tone is 10 to the minus 5 watts. And the shout, a loud shout, corresponds to 3 times 10 to the minus 2 watts. If all the residents of New York were to talk at the same time, the total sound volume would be about 100 watts, equivalent to the electric power requirement of a medium-sized light bulb. Yet the power required to fill a large auditorium with loud sound is considerable. The intensity at an individual point is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the sound wave and also proportional to the frequency of the wave. Let's consider an example. In this example, we use the definition of intensity to calculate the average the power emitted by an array of speakers. A sound system for a 2,000 seat auditorium is designed to produce a 1.0 watt per square meter sound intensity over the surface of a hemisphere 20 meters in radius. What acoustic power is needed from an array of speakers at the center of the sphere. Well, the total power needed is the intensity, power per unit area, times the area of a hemisphere. The area of a hemisphere surface is half of the area of the uh, surface of the um, surface area of the sphere. So this is one half. And this is times 4 pi r squared, where r squared is the distance. And we're saying this is 20 meters is the, uh, is the distance. So we throw this into a calculator and calculate. So this um, uh, area is 2,500 square meters. So the total acoustic power needed is 1.0 watts per meter squared times 2,500 square meters. The meters squared cancel we get 2,500 watts or 2.5 kilowatts. As a reflection, the efficiency of loudspeakers in converting electrical energy into sound is not very high. Typically a few percent for ordinary speakers and up to 25 percent for horn type speakers. The electrical output input to the speakers would need to be considerably greater than this because of their efficiency. However, 1.0 watts per uh, square meter is a very large sound. This is actually at the threshold of pain and definitely in the range where permanent hearing damage is likely. A lot of um, rock musicians actually have such damage and people who go to concerts frequently sometimes have that damage as well. The power emitted by sound source represents the energy per unit that is being carried away from the source by sound waves. If a sound wave has an amplitude A and a frequency F, then the power is proportional to the square of the amplitude and the square of the frequency. That is, power is proportional to the product of A squared and F squared. That means if the amplitude of a sound wave is doubled, then its power will be quadrupled times four. Similarly, if the frequency is increased, the power is increased by the square of the frequency. The simplest source of sound is a point source that emits its power uniformly in all directions. It, it uh, basically goes out in spherical waves. For such a source, the intensity at a distance r from the source is inversely proportional to r squared. That is, I is equal to P over 4 pi R squared, which is the surface area of the sphere. The average intensity I2 through a sphere with a different radius R sub 2 is given by a similar expression. If no energy is absorbed between the two spheres, then the power must be the same. It is the same here. And so that means the power is the intensity times this. So what we have is uh, we're cross multiplying 4 pi r1 squared i1 is equal to 4 
pi r2 squared i2. If we divide both sides by, um, well, we divide um, i1 by i2, that's going to be r2 squared divided by r1 squared. That means, you recall, is that the t intensity at any distance r is therefore inversely proportional to r squared. This inverse square relationship also holds for various other energy flow situations involving a point source, such as light emitted by a point source. Decibels. Because the ear is sensitive over such a broad range of intensities, a logarithmic intensity scale is usually used. The intensity level or sound level beta of a sound wave is defined by beta is equal to 10. And then this is a unit called decibel. So beta is equal to 10 decibel times the logarithm, and this is logarithm base 10, of i divided by i0. In this equation, I0 is a reference intensity chosen to be 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. And log denotes logarithm base 10, not the natural logarithm. The units of beta are decibels, that's abbreviated dB. A sound wave with an intensity I equals to I0 equal 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter uh, has an intensity level of zero. So zero um, uh, corresponds to, this is gonna be uh, I zero, so that's the log of one, which is a uh, zero, that's what makes this, uh, this zero. So uh, this is the intensity, uh, zero dB is the threshold of sound. This level, corresponds roughly to the faintest whisper. This is the threshold of sound that can be heard by a person with normal hearing. Although that depends on the frequencies of the sound. The intensity at the threshold of pain is about one watt per square meter. And that corresponds to an intensity level of 120 dB. Now, the following table gives intensity levels in decibels of some familiar noises. It's taken from a survey made by um, some no noise abasement commissions. So you see rock concerts are very high and very dangerous. This is the threshold of pain. Uh, this is a rivener. Um, we have the rustle of leaves. Ordinary conversations and here down here is the threshold of hearing and here are the sound levels in decibels. Let's test your understanding of this with a, an example. You measure a sound intensity beta 1 equal 40 dB at a distance of 5 meters from a sound source. You then move further from the source and measure the sound intensity level again. And this time you record the sound level is beta 2 is equal to 20 dB. What is your final distance from the source? And it could be 10, 25, or 50. Well, you begin by noting that the sound intensity I decreases by a factor of 10 for each 10 dB reduction in the sound intensity level. That's because it is logarithm base 10. Therefore, the sound intensity at a position 2 is 100 times smaller than that at position 1. Uh, that means uh, 100 is 10 squared. Now we use this fact that the sound intensity itself must vary as 1 over r squared, where r is the distance from the source. Putting these together, we conclude that in order for the intensity to decrease by a factor of 100, position 2 must be 10 times further from the source than position 1. The correct answer then would be C. Let's look at another example.
the title of which is Temporary Deafness. We're going to insert sound level to sound intensity. A 10 minute exposure to 120 dB sound typically shifts your threshold of hearing temporarily from 0 dB to 28 dB. You really can't hear very well after such a concert, for example. Studies have shown that on average, 10 years of exposure to 92 dB sound causes a permanent shift of up to 28 dB. What intensities correspond to 28 dB in 92 dB? So we're going to set this up and solve it by looking at the definition of, um, uh, we're going to look at our previous equation. We're going to divide both sides by 10 dB. And then take the inverse logarithms uh, of both sides to get that I is equal to I0, this is 10, this is beta divided by 10 dB. So when beta is 28, we put 28 in here for beta, and uh, I0 is 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. So we plug this into a calculator, and we get that this is 6.3 times 10 to the minus 10 watts per square meter. When beta is 92 dB, we will plug 92 into this equation, and we will get uh, 10 to the minus um, 12, and this is 10 to the 9.2. This is 6.3 times 10 to the minus 3 watts per square meter. Another example. Consider an idealized model of a sound emitted by a singing bird. Now this bird is a point source and the bird has a certain power associated with their, um, their song. Assume the bird acts as a point source of sound with constant power, I guess I said all that, so that the intensity is given by uh, the equation that I is equal to I zero, um, or excuse me, that, uh, that the, uh, the intensity is equal to P divided by four pi r squared. How many dB does the sound intensity drop when you move to a point twice as far from the bird? So you got this guy that's standing at point P1 and listening to the bird, and then he moves to point P2 that is twice as far. So when you double your distance from the point source of the sound, how much does your sound intensity level drop? Let's label the two points, one and two. I'm going to use the equation twice and subtract it. So the difference between the sound intensity levels, which we're supposed to find is beta two <clears throat> minus beta one is given by beta two minus beta one is equal to 10 dB times log I two over I zero minus log I one over I zero. Now we use the property of logarithms where the logarithm of the quotient is the difference of the logs. We use it here and we use it here. And here we're taking a minus that we're going to distribute over this whole thing. And so what will happen is that this is minus log I zero and this is minus minus is plus log I zero so it drops out. And then I will have log I two minus log I one, which is the logarithm of the quotient. So this is 10 dB log I two over I one. But now we're going to use the ratio of intensities that I one over I two is the same thing as R one squared over R two squared. That means we have 10 dB and we have these logarithms here of R one squared divided by R two squared. But we know that R2 is twice R1, so we put that in. Now, if you look at this, you see that the R1 squares cancel, and this ends up being uh, the logarithm of 1 over 4. So 10 dB times the log of 1 over 4. You pound this into your calculator, and you get minus 6.0 dB. 
So a decrease in intensity by a factor of 4 corresponds to a 6 dB decrease in the sound intensity level. We invite you to prove, and this is something that often is on certification tests actually, not the proof, but the fact. We invite you to prove that an increase in the intensity by a factor of 2 corresponds to about a 3 dB increase. And there's practice problems here as well. Our next topic is beats. Previously, we talked about the interference effects that occur when two different waves with the same frequency uh, overlap in the same region of space. We're going to look at a picture of this in just a minute, uh, but uh, we're going to consider a particular point in space where they overlap. So um, we're going to look at the picture here. And so we're taking two sound waves with slightly different frequencies. Well, they will interact, but they'll move at different rates. So sometimes they will overlap and add directly. Other times they will cancel with each other when they're out of step. And if you look at the red one interacting with the blue one, you see that the net, the vector sum, will be beats. So the two waves interfere constructively when they're in step and destructively when they are a half cycle out of step. The resulting wave waxes, grows, and wanes, gets smaller in intensity, and it forms beats. This is the beat frequency. Um, owls use beat frequency of the uh, difference of the frequencies just between their eyes to capture insects, to locate them. Sometimes as small as 10 microseconds is the difference of the time that the sound waves are, are received by their ears. Also, sonar has been used, uh, a little bit like ultrasound, where you take a 50 kilohertz signal, send it down, and then it would come back, and you can get imaging this way. And that has been used in uh, seafaring research at the Titanic and other places. Now, you can show that the beat frequency is always the difference between the two beats, F1 and F2. And this is a mathematical proof. Now, I'm not going to hold you responsible for the proof of this, but I am going to hold you responsible for this equation that the frequency of the beat is equal to F1 minus F2. This is very important in our work on Doppler, which will be coming up next. But till then, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. May God bless you all.